Um, and in honor of our dearly departed friend from this last week, Halloween listening this today is Eddie Van Halen. He'll be missed. The guy was not much for uh, for hair metal, but he was he could play guitar and write songs. All right, so we'll talk about quiz questions today, and we'll talk a little bit more about confirmers, and we're going to spend a big chunk of time on on cycloalkanes. Specifically, um, we're going to talk about cyclohexane a lot, um, and for whatever reason, it's been this way since the 70s. Cyclohexane gets, gets kind of overanalyzed to death as sort of a a good system to study because it kind of covers a lot of the same concepts that other molecules will will um, use. So it, it brings in a lot of those those concepts and it's a good practice for visualizing things in 3D. Um, despite the, and it is a really common, really stable molecule. Um, but for whatever reason, they they chose that molecule to be the the one that we're going to study and spend a significant amount of time on over something like cyclopentane, um, which is a little bit harder to to see. Uh, so we're going to spend most of our time talking about that and visualizing how we can build these things. Um, and, uh, and we'll go from there. We'll start with quiz questions. Um, you guys overall did did pretty well on on the quiz, um, although it is some of these questions, isomers versus conformers, um, were kind of tricky. Um, and again, remember that that one of your one of your best tools is if you get good at naming things, and remember to put your numbers wherever you you have to, and and especially if you're trying to answer an isomers or conformers question. Um, use the numbers more than it seems like you have to just for the sake of making sure that you actually got two different isomers. Um, but that actually is, is a really useful tool in, in figuring this out. Because if we look at this, these top two molecules, they're both pentane, one, two, three, four, five, and they're both dimethylpentane. But in the example on the left, we have 2,2-dimethylpentane. Two, two and the example on the right is 3,3-dimethylpentane. Three, three so the fact that you, would, you have two different numbers, if we wanted to actually take the molecule on the left and convert it to the molecule on the right, we would actually need to break these methyls off and then reattach them. And that's your clue that it's, an, that it's isomers, not conformers. All right, so anytime you name things and you if you try to name it and you get two different names and you're sure you're following all the rules for naming, that's almost a dead giveaway that it's two different isomers. All right, especially if you can look at it and say, okay, to get from this one to that one, I would need to break bonds. So for the first one, it was isomers. For the second one, if we're looking at our longest continuous carbon chain. There are two ways we could count it. We could count it that way and get heptane. Or we could count it this way and get heptane as well. And remember, in general, the way that we want to count is the way that keeps all of our branches simple. If we counted the, the way I drew it first, counted this way, we wind up with an isopropyl group, right? A methyl ethyl group. And if we can count a different way and still get seven in a row that in a way that doesn't give us a complicated branch, we should do that. So the second way I drew it is the better way to count. <clears throat> and so if we're trying to name this now, it's going to be dimethyl and an ethyl group. So our overall molecule name here is going to be let's see. We've got 
two comma four, and that, the parentheses are a little unnecessary, are unnecessary here. Two comma four dimethyl three ethyl heptane. And if we find our longest continuous carbon chain on the other side, sorry, um, the laundry room is right outside my office. So occasionally when we need laundry dried, you will hear the laundry buzzer. Um, if we count this way, we again get heptane. So that's a point of, of it being a conformer. And if we number it, we will also get 2,4-dimethyl-3-ethyl heptane. Because remember, we want to keep the numbers low. So we start counting from this side. So on carbon 2 and 4, we're going to wind up having methyl groups on carbon 3. Yikes. Um, we're going to have an ethyl group. So the fact we got the same name twice, making sure to use all of our numbering, tells us it is, in fact, conformers. Right? So if you can't see it off the top of your head, sometimes, especially as you guys get good at this, you'll be able to just look at a molecule and say, oh, those are conformers. If you can't see it, name both versions of it and see if you get the same name. Speaking of naming things, um, you guys are getting pretty good at this. The auto grader, of course, marks you down because you put spaces in the wrong spot or a comma instead of a hyphen, like you guys are used to. Um, the, the principal thing to watch out for on this left-hand molecule is remember, we don't count into or out of a ring. So if we don't have more than six continuous carbons in any straight in any straight chain. Then six is our longest continuous carbon chain, and it's a cyclo group. All right, so we would our base molecule here is going to be cyclohexane. Um, and then. This one has an isopropyl group, or we could call it a methyl ethyl group, and they you can number it either when one of two ways. If we're choosing which number to keep as low as possible, it might as well be the bigger group. Um, we'll just get used to keeping things with higher priority as low as possible. In this case, they're both alkane branches, so it's not going to matter that much, um, but it's just a good habit to be in. So one, we'll say one. And then isopropyl or methyl ethyl for methyl cyclohexane. Um, a couple of mistakes that I saw were um, to to either to count this as a as a dimethyl group on a methyl. But that's not your longest continuous carbon chain of the branch. The longest continuous carbon chain on the branch is two carbons. So it's an ethyl group that has a methyl on it. The other thing is, is um, a couple people switched ethyl and methyl in here. So they said it was an ethyl methyl group, which doesn't really make sense because an ethyl group is bigger than a methyl. And whatever your longest continuous carbon chain is supposed to be the one that that controls this. So you have to, it would be the methyl applying to the ethyl. How's everybody feeling on the nomenclature questions? Still getting your head wrapped around it, but makes sense. Hopefully nobody's super confused. Good. And then last but not least, if we count these, we got an octane. I didn't do anything tricky with it. Um, we did not 
I'm not sure if we explicitly did an example that had a, a cyclo group as a substituent, but the rules are the same as a branch. We're just going to, so it's octane. And then we can say it's two bromo. And then counting, we get one, two, three, four, five. If it was just a straight five carbons off the side, it would be a pentyl group. It's, if they're in a ring, it's just a cyclopentyl group. Right, so it's like cyclopentane, except you drop the A-N-E, you drop ane, and you replace it with Y-L to indicate that it's a branch. Can I ask a quick question? Of course. So if that was hexane, would it be two bromo five cyclohexyl octane? Yes. Okay. And even though, yeah, even, even though we could get even bigger, if it was a heptyl group, a cycloheptyl group, seven carbons in a row, our, our longest continuous carbon chain would still be octane. It would not be the ring structure. But if we got any bigger than that, then it starts getting, we would switch it. If, if it was a cyclonal group, if it was a nine-sided ring attached, then all of a sudden the nine-sided ring would be our longest continuous carbon chain. And we would name it as cyclonone with a really complicated branch hanging off of it. All right, so once we get to that point where the ring is bigger than the chain, we switch with the, what the parent molecule would be. Sean, what if they're the same? Then you can name it whichever way keeps your branches simple. So for example, if I, if we look at a, um, a cyclopentane that's attached to one, two, three, four, five, a cyclopentyl group that's attached to a pentane. Um, we could name that either as cyclopentyl pentane, or we could name it as cyclopentane that has a complicated branch attached to it. It would usually make more sense to name it in the way that keeps our branch simple. And a cyclo group is easier and is simple. Doesn't we don't have to use parentheses for it? Um, so if it was just this molecule, I would name it as cyclopentyl pentane and it's on carbon three if it had something like if there was a methyl group over there now all of a sudden i would have to name this cyclopentyl group with parentheses it would be a two methyl cyclopentyl in parentheses. And so all of a sudden now I had a complicated chain no matter which way I name it. And so that at that point it doesn't make too much of a difference. And the main thing again is that you can go from the name to the structure in and without um, any ambiguity that anybody who knows our rules would be able to get to the right structure from your name. If your name is unambiguous, then I'm not going to mark you down for it, even if I would have counted it a different way. Any other nomenclature questions? We'll get more practice with that here in a little bit as we keep adding things. So when, I'm, when I go to screen share, sometimes it makes the Zoom window pop up on top of where, where I'm looking at my slides. Can you guys see that or is that invisible to you? Can you see your yourselves ever show up when I first hit go to screen share? All right. Zoom has an option that says keep Zoom interface invisible when screen sharing, but I don't think it works all the way, apparently. Um, anyway, just out of curiosity. Um, this one gave you guys a little bit of trouble. The main thing that I saw people get mixed up with here was they switched which side is going to be the chlorines and the bromines. Most of you guys got that the, that the methyls are going to go straight up and straight down. 
Um, but some people had trouble with the figuring out which side the bromines and the chlorines would be on. So I'm going to go back to the board again. If we're taking this molecule that looks like So remember, all of these, these carbons that we're looking at are going to have four things attached. In this case, it's got four things explicitly drawn. If the chlorines are sticking out at us, then when we put our eye where the eye is on the, on the diagram, looking this way, we're going to want to make sure that and I might need to go back and give more partial credit on this because we did talk about this. Um, to me, it makes more sense to keep my feet on the ground, um, literally, when I'm looking at these. So that I would look at this, looking down this bond here. And if I'm looking at the front, I'm going to have that Y shape going straight down. If I'm standing in the board looking over at it, going down is going to be the methyl. And if the chlorine was coming out of the board, if I'm now standing in the board looking sideways, the chlorine's on my right. And then the bromines going into the board are on your left. Um, and then if we're looking at the second carbon, so it's in a in a, a staggered configuration. So if I'm looking at the second carbon, again, chlorine sticking out, so it's on the right hand side. Bromine is sticking in, so it's on the left hand side. And the methyl is straight up. So for those of us that drew the bromines on the right it's basically flipped because on you're drawing on the left the chlorines are coming out of the board right so because the chlorines are coming out of the board here they should be on the right hand side if you drew them switched but you still drew this as the regular y not an upside down y then you got it backward if you if we did this and you put your eye right here like it's supposed to be, but you put your feet on the ceiling, you could get your chlorines would then be on the left, but then this, this Y shape in the front would be totally flipped. So in that case, it would look like, um, instead of the methyl going down, you'd have the front methyl going up. And then, now I flip myself over. That would put the chlorines on the left, the bromine on the right. Um, but almost every, I think everybody who who put the chlorines on the left and the bromine on the right did it this way. So they didn't flip it all the way upside down, which means you yeah, got it backwards. That's what I did. And it's in this case we don't. Um, we haven't covered why yet, but you actually drew the mirror image of this molecule, which is not the same molecule. That's what's called a stereoisomer, um, which stereoisomer literally means there are two isomers where everything is the same except one piece of it is flipped. There are two versions of it. In this case, if you draw the mirror image of this one, um, it is not the same molecule because to get from one compromer to the other, if I wanted to go from, from this compromer to the one where the chlorines are on the right and bromines are on the left, I would actually have to break a bromine off and then reattach it on the other side, which tells us it's two different isomers. And we'll, so it doesn't necessarily seem that bad yet to have mixed those up. And it's not that bad. You guys are still just learning this. Um, so don't be too worried about it. But um, 
it is in fact two different molecules. So like I said, I'll go back and double check, make sure nobody did it just with their feet on the ceiling. Um, but I don't think that that was, that was the case. Any other questions on these? I cut somebody off. Somebody was about to say something now. It's me. I'm the one. I actually did it where my feet were on the ceiling. Okay. Yeah, I'll go back and, and uh, give points for that because I didn't even, at 10 o'clock last night when I was grading these, it didn't even occur to me that I had said that last week. Um, so, and, you know, it'll be easier if you if you do keep your feet on the floor, literally and, and figuratively and you know, keep it, keep it as much the same dimensions as you can when you're doing these rotating problems. Um, and frankly, physically moving is not a bad way to do it. If you're looking at it on your screen and you stand up at your desk and walk to the side and try and visualize it as 3D, okay, it was sticking out of the board, then keep your thumb in the same spot and walk to the side and look at it, look at which way your thumb is then pointing. Um, that's not a bad way to do it. That, or if you get some molecular model kits, um, we can, uh, or you can build it and actually just pick it up and rotate it. Um, and actually that hadn't occurred to me. We have some molecular model kits on campus. Uh, I don't still have access to those. Um, they cut down everybody who's allowed to be on campus to almost nobody at this point because we had another positive test case. Um, so, but I think Mariola still has access, so I can, and she's looking for projects, so I could have her set up a couple of, of uh, sets for you guys to check out from the library. Um, yeah, if there's some interest, okay, um, I'll uh, I'll make a list later today then, um, and uh, and get that over to her. So later this week, um, I'll send out an, an email, um, and you guys just respond to the email, and I'll get your name on the list for the people, and you can take them home, and you'll just be responsible for bringing back all the pieces um, at the at the end of the quarter. Cool. Um, good, good idea, you class. Thanks for helping me with that. All right. Random quiz questions. We'll save. Um, we'll save the second two of these. They're related to neurotransmitters to for beginning a class on Thursday, but global distillation was a term I had not actually heard before. Um, and since we had talked about distillation in in uh, lab last week, thought that this was a good a good thing to talk about. Um, this is something that uh, that it turns out people were really kind of confused about for a long time. Um, organic molecules, volatile organic molecules that don't exist in nature. Um, so things that were being used as synthetic pesticides or um, fertilizers or medications um, started showing up in the weirdest places when they started looking really carefully in small concentrations. They basically found that despite the fact that, that these synthetic fertilizers and, and pesticides were only being used in temperate and tropical areas, they were being found in polar regions. Um, and nobody knew exactly why that was. It was. They were showing up in people's diets. They were showing up in people's bodies that lit, had lived above the, you know, the Arctic Circle line their entire life. Um, and they didn't know why this was until somebody suggested that maybe the Earth as a whole was acting as one giant distillation apparatus. Because that's what we see with, with weather patterns, right? Because everything evaporates at the poles or at the, the equator. Um, turns into condensation and then condenses when it gets up to the temperate region and comes down as rain. And then it re-evaporates from temperate, temperate zone and moves further north to where it's colder again and recondenses again and comes down as precipitation. Um, but what they're, what they're finding is that that's not just limited to water. They're actually seeing a distillation pattern of a lot of organic molecules from the tropical and temperate regions moving their way towards the poles. And it's, it can be explained entirely as, as a, uh, a function of um, distillation because you've got things that are hot, warming up, turning into the gas phase, 
and moving, the air currents naturally move them northward or south, um, depending on what hemisphere you're in, and where they get cold again and they recondense and they come down in the rain or are pulled out of the, the atmosphere by, by plants. Um, so it's, it's uh, an interesting system. It's the earth as one giant ap distillation apparatus. And that's not a, that's one of these, um, these global systems that is not a conspiracy theory that's actually measured and that actually can be explained just like the systems that we're talking about in lab. Um, so good question. I, uh, I learned something from that one and that, those are my favorite kind of questions. So, um, we'll talk about neurotransmitters and taste receptors on Thursday though. All right. And even if I don't answer your question in class, you guys know that I'm, um, you guys see that I'm writing comments on your quizzes, right? So, you know, you can go back and I don't always leave the most detailed feedback as to why you lost points, but I at the very least try to answer your questions, especially if they're relevant to, to the class material. Um, if you ask me, I really need help with this topic. I will not I won't just leave you hanging on that. Um, there were two good quiz questions that were not just, I don't get how to do number one, but they were related to the class material and confirmations. Um, so these are, are really good questions. Um, the first one is, can molecules exist as confirmations all the time? Like an electron can be anywhere within an orbital at, at any given second, or they only exist as one given confirmation at a time. So basically, are we talking about Heisenberg uncertainty principle and quantum stuff, or are we talking about um, like we're actually physically moving? So in, in this case, so in resonance, it was uncertainty, right? And we could have our electrons and charges are going to be spread out all over the molecule. And all of those resonance structures are true at the same time. Um, that's not how these molecules behave. When you get to something just as small as a hydrogen nucleus, it's 2,000 times bigger than an electron. And that's big enough that the uncertainty principle doesn't really apply the same way. And we talk about something that's a, you know, even bigger than that. Um, we, we really are talking about a physical object at that point, and quantum does not apply as much. Quantum really only is going to apply to electrons moving, um, just based on the sizes. Um, and so these, if we're talking about a single molecule, it will actually exist as distinct confirmations. It will be in one shape at any given point. Um, but on the flip side of that is if you actually have, you know, even just a tiny, tiny percentage of a mole, if we have 0.1 grams of a compound, that's still going to be like 10 to the minus six moles, which is still going to be like 10 to the positive 17 molecules. So if, if we have 10 to the 17 molecules, that's a fairly large sample size. I think almost any statistician would be pretty satisfied with that. Is there n equals 17, 10 to the 17, right? Um, and so really what we will have is an equilibrium system where everything is constantly moving back and forth between the different confirmations. And exactly what that distribution looks like will depend on what the temperature is. You know, is it 90% one confirmation and 10% a second confirmation? Or is it more like 99 to one? Or is it closer to 50-50? All of that's going to depend on the temperature. Um, but it's, and so it's, the answer to the question is kind of both. From a, from a statistics point of view, we're looking at such large number of molecules, we're going to have a distribution of all of these possibilities. In the sense of looking at a single molecule, it's going to be kind of fluctuating back and forth. And it's going to, we could say things like it'll spend 90% of its time in this shape and 10% of its time in that shape. Is that Can I want to ask a related question? Please. Um, I think you already said it before, but I was just wondering where the energy comes from if the molecule is going uphill in energy. But I think it has to do with entropy and Gibbs free energy and all that, right? Entropy and Gibbs free energy definitely, and and the energy is is coming from um, temperature basically. 
um, as when you have something at room temperature. Remember, temperature is basically, um, it's not basically, it is a measure of the average kinetic energy of the atoms in, a, in any system. That's what we measure as temperature. And so if we have something at room temperature, that means that you've got all of the different molecules have a, a distribution of kinetic energies. They're all bouncing around like ping pong balls in a, in a box that you're shaking. And so that's, that is the energy that kind of gives these things um, the ability to flip back and forth. And that's why when we drop the temperature, that changes equilibrium constants and rate constants. So remember that that equilibrium constants and rate constants had that. Um, I just realized I was not sharing my screen that whole time, but that's okay. I think I still answered the question well. Um, if we have some potential energy surface where we've got our, our more stable configuration, our less stable configuration, and some activation energy, which we can call Ea, and our change in energy for the reaction, which we can call delta E for the reaction. Remember that our equilibrium constant and our rate constant are based on those two energies. There was that, um, that equation. So for an equilibrium constant, if it's capital K, it's E to the negative delta E of reaction over RT. And if it was an equal or a, a rate constant, it'd be lowercase k equals some pre-exponential factor, we call it, e to the negative activation energy over RT. Those two equations look really similar because the molecule, they're both actually using um, the statistical distribution of energies at a given temperature. These are basically functions that will, if you plot um, the kinetic energy, average kinetic energy as a function of temperature, you get something that looks like a bell curve. Um, and so these are these functions govern how many molecules have enough energy at any given point to go through this, um, this process or what the ratio is at equilibrium between these the products and reactants. And so and you can see that there's this T term that shows up in there that's going to be a how the temperature influences what percentage of the molecules have enough energy to do this process. So the and we're gonna we'll keep coming back to this as well. Um, but this means at room temperature in general, things are always happening. Um, almost all of these different conformations we're talking about can, can exist at room temperature. And so it's going to be switching back and forth very, very quickly and very, very um, rapidly. So we will be at equilibrium um, for, these, for these systems. And I just lost you guys, there you go. Um, which brings me to the last question here, which, is always a good question to ask. How much of this is theoretical and is uh, hypothetical? How much and how much of this is actually, you know, mirrors what we can show in a lab? Um, and this is this is a these ideas of these different conformers and these equilibrium concentrations um, are both basically they're they are. Um, they, the concepts that we're talking about started as being a theory, um, just like using these, these equations to figure out K and lowercase K. Um, that was all what Boltzmann did, Ludwig Boltzmann, um, back in the 1800s before quantum even existed. Boltzmann was one who, uh, who figured out, who basically founded a field called statistical mechanics or statistical thermodynamics, which was is using stats um, to study physical systems at the molecular level. Um, so it's not quantum related at all, but we wind up with these distributions that are actually accurate, that mirror what we see in the real world. And, and then 
we can see them if we cool down these, we, if we take a snapshot and we cool it, these molecules all the way down to liquid nitrogen, get them into a really good crystal structure, we can measure these exact structures um, by doing X-ray crystallography, which is just bouncing X-rays through a crystal and you look at where they bounce off and what angles they bounce off at and you can actually measure where the nuclei are. And so we can actually show exactly what the individual geometries look like experimentally and it matches really well what we would predict them to look like look like based on vesper geometries and based on on these different confirmations so it is um we cannot actually see them with a microscope um, but we can experimentally show that these confirmations do exist and that we do have these equilibrium systems um, and we'll talk more about that um, in a few minutes when we start talking about cyclohexane. Um, but we can also do things like isotopic labeling. If you if you start with a molecule in one conformer and you replace, say, a carbon with a carbon 13 that we can then track, um, we can actually look at carbon 13 and say, okay, this carbon 13 was in this position in this molecule. And if it goes through a conformer change, it'll switch to being in this position. And then, so then they let it get to equilibrium and then cool it back down. And they find out that they actually wind up with a distribution of the carbon 13 here versus here that matches what the Boltzmann distribution would predict. Um, so basically chemists, chemists and biochemists and biologists have to be very, very clever with how we can actually measure things at the, at the uh, uh, molecular level because we can't just pull out the microscope and check it out. Um, but we can find other ways to indirectly show that these theories are correct or match what, um, what we see in the lab. All right. Um, let's go over the, we're going to re, redo those couple slides on ring energy, on rings and strain energy before we take our break um, and then we'll move into new material after break so the anytime we and this is not just um for for cyclic structures we see it the most in cyclic structures um but anytime we've got a a molecular structure where there are some constraints that are going to force things away from being their ideal geometry which for tetrahedral carbons would be 109.5 degrees between bond angles. Anytime it's, we have a tetrahedral carbon that's not allowed to be at that bond angle, we're forcing these electrons to be closer than they want to be. These orbitals that are making up the different sigma bonds are being forced and pushed closer together by something, um, which creates some amount of what we call strain energy. And it can look um, like a number of things. And to some extent, you're going to force these, these orbitals closer together. And to some extent, the orbitals will resist that. Like when we look at cyclopropane, cyclopropane, if it was actually a perfect equilateral, equilateral triangle, we'd have a bond angle of 60 between each of these carbon, carbon bonds, right? Um, it looks like it should be that because when we draw it as a skeletal structure, we draw it as a triangle. Um, but what we actually see is we, we actually also just weaken the bonds themselves. Instead of just forcing the electrons to be too close together, the electrons kind of resist that because they're, they repel each other, right? Electrons push away other electrons. And so we actually wind up with something that doesn't look like a triangle at all, that looks more like a you know, lopsided circle or lop where you've got these um, sigma bonds that don't fully overlap the way we would normally expect it to, to be. Um, and so if we just looked at the bond angles as being carbon to carbon to carbon, yeah, it's, it has to be six, 60 degrees because we only have three points here and they're all identical. But if we actually look at what the orbitals look like, they wind up with this sort of bent outward shape. And when you have these orbitals in this bent outward shape, they are much weaker bonds. 
because we just we physically aren't able to overlap these orbitals as much, which means those electrons can't really be truly covalent. They can't be around both valences simultaneously if we're, we don't have a way to overlap the orbitals, right? And so that weakens these bonds to the point where we actually wind up with a lot of energy being released just by breaking this molecule apart. It actually winds up, it'll rearrange some way to try and fill as many, um, as many valences as possible. And it'll either steal electrons from what else is around, um, depending on, you know, if we have oxygen around, it'll probably just burn um, because we we'll wind up just making CO2 and water because that's more stable than than carbon carbon bonds or carbon hydrogen bonds. Um, and we wind up with it also differing from what we would expect just based on the geometry in terms of it kind of it arranges itself so that these hydrogens wind up not being in a truly eclipsed conformation. Remember those that eclipse conformation, if we're looking at a Newman projection, would be both these hydrogens directly in front of each other. You know, like an eclipse, the, the planets are aligned to use 90s cartoon lingo. Um, just felt like every 90s cartoon had had an episode. Oh, the planets are aligned. That's what staggered or what eclipsed confirmation looks like. You get all of your atoms in a straight line. Um, and so it actually tweaks the geometries just a little bit, even a little bit further um, so that we can avoid having these hydrogens directly on top of each other. Um, and so that's what they call torsional strain. Torsional strain is the strain on a ring structure that basically bends it a little bit out of being a flat molecule in order to get those hydrogens to not be on top of each other. So Sean, um, on the image on the right, you can't really mm -hmm. see the torsional strain, right? Correct. You can see the angle strain, yeah. Yes. That's exactly right. The image on the right is showing the angle strain and how those bonds um, are weaker because you can't have the orbitals overlapping as much. The image on the left is showing you the torsional strain. And basically because the torsional strain is almost always going to be to try and keep things from being in an eclipsed conformation. Um, if you wanted to show torsional strain, you're usually going to be using a Newman projection of some sort because that's how we can, we can look right down the bond, say between this carbon and this carbon and see how those, those bonds line up. We've basically taken the molecule on the right-hand side and flipped it up on its end. So we're looking at it. So as the ring is flat, more or less. Mind if I ask a question? Please. Uh, I think you already said it, but I think I missed it. What is like the driving force behind those two different things? So mostly that electrons don't want to be around other electrons. So in, in this case, if you have the, if you had it truly in the eclipsed conformation, you'd wind up with those bonds being physically closer together than if you could twist them a little bit. If I do it like, like this, having having the two hydrogen carbon hydrogen bonds slightly pointed in different directions allows those sigma bonds to not be interfering with each other basically pushing on each other as much and that's the same thing that we'll see in this case we don't wind up with with true with a true triangle here because that would force this electron cloud and this electron cloud to be too close together because the electrons themselves are going to push away other electrons, it'll basically create that strain, that angle strain energy, where you've got two things, because it's strain, it's, uh, it's a little bit like, like any sort of, of stress um, in the mechanical sense, where you have two forces that are opposing each other that need to balance out. You've got the fact that you want to have these valences full, and the and the way it's doing that is by having the cyclopropane group. So you've got one force that's trying to keep these bonds close together to make this ring structure. Then you've got the other force, which is the bonds themselves pushing on each other. To go back to our 
road trip analogy, um, it would be there would be a lot less strain between having two 250 pound dudes in the back of your car um, if you just didn't go on a road trip, right? But if you're going on a road trip, there's some force, there's some drive um, to get everybody in the car going the same direction, right? That you can think of that as filling the valences. But then those two big dudes in the back seat are still going to try and push each other away and be as far apart as possible while still being in the car. If it got really, really strained, then maybe one of those guys decides, hey, I don't need to go on this road trip that much and just doesn't go. That'd be like breaking the ring entirely. Now, all of a sudden, we don't have that ring structure because we removed one of those competing forces, essentially. Um, and we see this in, in all of these ring structures to some extent, they're pretty much always going to try and not be in that eclipse conformation. So with the exception of cyclopropane, which is forced to some extent, not to some extent, I can, I can say that um, three carbons by definition of how three dimensions works and how geometry works, three carbons have to be in a flat plane, right? It takes three planes to define or three points to define a plane. And so if you have only three carbons in your ring, that ring has to be flat because you can't have three points that aren't flat. Um, that's just physically not possible in the universe that we live in. Um, I'm sure that I said that wrong. The mathematicians and the physicists would take issue with exactly how I said that. Um, and they'd be right, but it's mostly when we got to things like non-Euclidean geometries, we didn't have an actual flat surface at all. We had um, if we're doing geometry on the surface of a sphere or something like that, um, then things get a little bit weird. Or if space time is really bent, like near a black hole, then geometry gets weird. Um, but let's just pretend we're not dealing with any of the theoretical physics and the complicated math. Three points will always be flat. Four points, though, doesn't have to be flat. And so any ring structure that's bigger than three rings is always going to be somewhat non-planar because that's how we can avoid having that torsional strain or that we have that torsional strain that's basically going to force it to not be flat in order to not have those hydrogens be eclipsed. So this is a, a decent figure at showing that, although you still have to use that, those wedges um, so basically this carbon up here is furthest away. And then you've got, if you think of these two carbons as being in the plane of the, of the screen, and then this carbon right here is pointed out towards us. Um, it's not gonna be a flat square. It's going to have this puckered shape where two of the points are gonna be further down and two of the points are further up slightly. Um, which actually makes this bond a little closer than 90 degrees, but it allows those hydrogens to not be eclipsed. So the torsional strain it actually it bends the square. If it was, if we just had a, a square, it'd be 90 degrees, right? That would be, those bonds would be slightly further apart, which we would normally think that's a good thing but that would force all of our hydrogens to be the same angles. And that means that they would be eclipsed. And so that creates the torsional strain that basically bends the corners away from each other a little bit, which makes it so it's not really 90 degrees, makes them a little bit closer, but it allows them to be in a staggered configuration instead of being eclipsed. So Sean, yeah, for the uh, cyclopropane, could you say that it has any torsional strain or is it that it can't be lessened because it kind of has like nowhere to go? It's always going to be a plane. That is a better question for Bruce because I'm not, I don't remember the laws of torque as well. Um, because if you did put torsional strain on something that was only three points, instead of bending it to be puckered, you would just twist the whole molecule. Um, 
And so what, what you wind up instead with cyclopropane is even if all three carbons have to be flat, you wind up with the hydrogens themselves, the hydrogen bonds moving away from each other because you can't force the molecule to not be planar. Um, but as far as whether that would be considered torsional strain, that might depend on the definition of torque and a plane and vectors um, and stuff that I haven't thought about in a long time. So I'm not gonna answer that one that explicitly. Um, and so one way we can see why this is helpful is if we, if I try and draw this as a Newman projection, if I try and draw cyclo, cyclobutane in a Newman projection, Um, you wind up with something that's going to look like, so here's our front carbon. There's our upside down Y. If you say that's H, that's an H. This was attached to our other carbon, right? And then on the carbon in the back, we would have something that's not quite going to be at a true staggered it's going to be a little bit closer than normal but that's going to be our other carbon so both of these carbons so we have two carbons here the one in front and the one behind that's that we can't see these are then attached together but what that does by having that that puckered geometry to it is it allows our hydrogens to be a lot closer to a staggered configuration. You can kind of see how that looks a little bit like a, if you remember that there's another carbon here, this is our square group, but we've kind of twisted the, the corners in order to get it in this shape. If we forced it to be flat, if we forced it to be flat, this carbon would come up a little bit. And so we would wind up with something that looked more like this, because these hydrogens are still going to try to be um, in a tetrahedral shape. This carbon would move up a little bit. And if we force this carbon down to do the same thing, to make it totally flat, these hydrogens would shift again. And you can see how we'd be getting closer to being eclipsed the more we force that, that square to be flat. All right, so that's that other force in this case is we've got the force that where we want these things to be staggered. And we also have the force that says keeping these bonds at 90 degrees is better than 88 degrees. Those are our two competing forces once again. Um, and pretty much any strain is going to, I think I can say this in the physics sense, anytime you have stress or strain on a system, it's because you have two forces working against each other. Right, I can't think of a, even if you wanna get into using stress and the, the way we use stress, talking about psychological stress, it's pretty much always because you have two different forces going on in your life and you're trying to balance them, right? That's sort of what, I think that's why they actually call it stress. Stress was a mechanical term before it was a psychological term. Um, and that's kind of what it means that you have two competing forces that you have to balance. Um, cyclopentane, we see the same thing. We'll go a little bit faster through this one again. Um, if we just looked at the bond angles, if we had a flat pentagon, we would have 108 degrees on a regular pentagon, which is really close to what, what tetrahedral structure should look like, right? So the ring, the angle strain should be nearly gone 
but we still have that torsional strain where these hydrogens are going to try to push each other away. And so that torsional strain is still going to bend it out of being flat, bend it out of plane. Um, and that creates some additional angle strain because instead of being at 108 degrees, these bonds are more like 100, and 100 degrees. I think it goes that far to try and keep these hydrogens from being eclipsed. Um, so it is significantly less strain than if we had four carbons, if we had cyclobutane. So remember that the, this graph is showing how much energy is released when we burn it and turn it into CO2 and, and water, which is about as stable as carbon can get. So if we take if we take it and we burn it and we have a lot of energy released, that means it was a really unstable molecule because we're, we're ending at the same point regardless. But if you're starting here versus starting up here, bigger enthalpy of combustion means that it was a less stable molecule to start with. Right, so, and we, we do see that there's a big jump in stability between four carbons and five carbons. We go from, you know, so that's a 20 kilojoule per mole difference, which is not insignificant. That's a, a significant amount of energy. Um, and, so, but it's not the lowest energy if we normalize per carbon, because it still does have that torsional strain. So cyclohexane winds up being the most stable cyclogroup. So here's the Newman projection of cyclopentane. So if we took the, the, the figure on the left and we rotated it, so we were looking right down that bond there, by bending it so that it's not a flat pentagon, that allows us to get that staggered configuration again, just like we were talking about with the butane. Um, and that then forces these carbon-carbon bonds to be closer than we would like. Cyclohexane, on the other hand, because if cyclohexane was, was totally flat, we'd have 120 degrees between each of the carbon-carbon bonds, which we don't even want that. That's, that's too much space in between those anyway, if they're, if they're tetrahedral shape, right? So that gives us enough freedom that we can twist the molecule around in a way that gets everything into a staggered configuration and still keeps everything close to 109.5 degrees for the bond angles. So that's why hexane, cyclohexane, has the lowest enthalpy of combustion because it has the, less, the least strain of any of these. And because we have just enough angles, we have just enough room and degrees of freedom that we can tweak these things around and make everything into a tetrahedral structure and keep it um, staggered. So in other words, very little stress because we don't have two different forces at that, that point. Everything can be satisfied, which is a stress-free environment, right? When you don't have to pick and choose between what you spend your time on, you're a lot less stressed like anybody has that kind of time. If you do have that kind of time, I recommend picking up a hobby because you're too stress-free. All right, let's take our break there. And when we come back, we're gonna get into cyclohexane. Let's come back at 10 after. <laughs> 
All right, let's go ahead and bring it back here. Talk about cyclohexane. And you know, I guess I guess this uh, this this energy of heat of combustion per CH two group it does do a decent job of explaining why we spend so much time on cyclohexane. They are the it is the most stable of any of the the cycloalkanes. Um, and looking at exactly why that is brings up a lot of these these points that we've been talking about. Um, the the two the two conformers that we see cyclohexane drawn in, um, and that the we see them um, in in these different um, conformers when we look at these these molecules, and we can model how stable they are relative to each other. Um, and therefore what the equilibrium constant will be between these two states. Um, but they both of these wind up being relatively stable in terms of being able to keep all of the hydrogens in um, staggered configurations and keep all of the carbons at roughly 109.5 degrees from each other. Um, and again, the, the if we draw them without the hydrogens, sometimes you can see exactly a little bit more what the structure looks like, why they call it chair and boat. <clears throat> um, and let's see, is it on the next slide? There's a, so I'll, I'll practice showing you how to draw these in a, in a few minutes. Um, we can follow a quick procedure for drawing these to actually get the chair confirmation drawn properly. Um, but when we actually look at these, these conformers, um, if we look at the chair conformer, if we look at the, the arms of the chair, if you want to visualize it that way, if we think of the two sides that are parallel to each other as being the arms or the sides of the chair, and then this point over here could be like the, the headrest of the chair of a recliner and this point down here would be the footrest of a recliner. Um, if we look at this, we actually wind up with everything arranged in a really, really convenient way so that there are no torsional strain, that all of those hydrogens wind up being pretty much perfectly in a in staggered figures. Um, <clears throat> so we actually wind up seeing it and this, so this would be looking at it from the footrest towards the headrest, right? So take the molecule on the left and rotate it so that you're looking down those, those armrests. Um, and, um, what we see is, I'm pulling up Mulview so we can look at it in 3D here in a second too. Um, is that we get all of these things being being perfectly spaced or nearly perfectly placed. Um, there's nothing specific about this carbon that is that that is that tricky. It's been right there for two minutes. All right, hang on one second, okay. Miss you get the start of Colindarios. Um, sorry, my son's Chromebook is acting up and I'm the tech expert, so he found me. Um, um, it isn't. Go, go, close the door. Sorry. Um, so when we, if we actually look at this in 3D, let's bring up cyclohexane in mole view. So very, very interesting skeletal structure here, right? Not much to see there. Um, and, but if we actually look just at the 3D and we can kind of arrange it so that it looks somewhat like the one we were just talking about, there we go. So we've got our two parallel sides here, our two armrests, there's our footrest, there's our headrest. Um, and so if we take this and we turn it, so we look from the footrest towards the headrest, put it in that Newman configuration, basically, 
it doesn't look exactly like that because you can still kind of see the two hydrogen or the two carbons behind. See that it does get them in a very, very, very close to a normal staggered shape and keeps all of the carbons at tetrahedral structures. Um, and there's nothing specific about this carbon at the bottom that makes it the foot rest. This is a three-dimensional molecule. If we twisted it around a little bit, a little bit, I could make this carbon the foot rest. That just changes our point of view. If I did it like that, now all of a sudden I switched which carbon is the foot rest. If I have them, I think I can even turn on labels. Maybe not. Um, but the point point remains, if you were watching very carefully, it was a bit of a, a um, three card Monty um, rotation I just did there, but I did actually switch which carbon was the foot rest. If I wanted to make it this carbon over here, if I want to draw this carbon as the foot rest, I just take it and rotate, right? So there's nothing unique about this carbon that's drawn at the bottom here. It's just, you have to pick a carbon to be the foot rest and a carbon to be the head rest, but any of them work, right? So that allows us to draw these in a lot of different ways that are convenient, especially once we start looking at substituted cyclohexanes. Um, we're, we're going to spend a lot of time, basically, we're always gonna put one of our substituents at either the head or the foot rest because that's gonna be the convenient way to visualize these things. Um, if we put it into the boat configuration, we actually do wind up with some, some torsional strain because the, that boat configuration that looks like this, let me go back here. We took this boat configuration on the right and twisted it so that the end of the boat was pointed towards us. So we're looking down these two parallel lines. We'd get something like this. And now all of a sudden, because we put it into that boat configuration, we wind up with the hydrogens in a stat in an eclipsed shape, an eclipsed conformer. So we that does add torsion to it, torsional strain. And it also has what are called flagpole interactions. If you think of this as being the front and the back of the boat. Um, the, think of the hydrogens that are sticking up above the boat as being flagpoles, they're going to be pointed slightly towards each other if these carbons are tetrahedral. So it actually is not super stable to be in that boat configuration. And even what did we see with the cyclopentane, if we do have these torsional interactions, it's going to try to twist it to not be eclipsed, right? And so we actually don't see a the chair or the uh, boat conformer is not actually super stable on some. We actually makes what's called a twist boat, where instead of being totally flat, where the base of the boat was would be, if we would normally draw it, we'd think, okay, the base of the boat is going to be um, a flat square. But that puts these two hydrogens running right into each other and puts all the other hydrogens as being um, eclipsed as well. So what actually happens is if we actually try to put it into a into a boat conformation, it actually tweaks itself. It turns that square into a puckered square, just like the cyclobutane did, which kind of allows it to get around that. Um, and we do see that these these different conformations are way higher in energy than chair. The chair conformation is is favored heavily. This is this. The amount of energy it takes to get from chair to this twist boat is way larger than any of the other transition energies we've talked about for these conformers. Um, and then going from when we get to this, this boat conformation, what we're really doing is if you visualize taking the chair and leave the top piece of it where it is, you leave the headrest and the arms where they are, and we're just taking the foot rest and extending it upward so that it's flat. But that's going to create all those all those torsional interactions. And so it doesn't stay there. That's the transition state. 
is when you put everything where everything is going to be eclipsed confirmation. And so that's what they call the half chair. When you're forcing the left hand side of it to be flat, but the right hand side, you're still leaving where it was. And so if you get to that, it's a little bit like flipping an umbrella inside out. You got, if you think of about an umbrella facing downward, if you try and then it gets caught by the wind, it flips backwards, right? It flips facing upward. That's a little bit of what we're doing here. And if you can visualize it, there's a point right in between when the umbrella is in its normal shape and when it's upside down, when it's totally flat. It's not gonna be very stable. It's not gonna stay there long. But that's sort of what we're doing here. We're flipping it from being from the bottom being here, and we're trying to get to it all the way up here. So when it's perfectly flat, though, you have a lot of unfavorable interactions for a split second, and that's what makes it that transition state. Hey, Sean. Yeah. Uh, would it be similar to uh, you know those rubber things that used to like they're like domes, and you would push them down on the desk, and they would like pop up type of deal? Yeah. Like the that. ones that either either went off as you're trying to put them down every time or that they flew across the classroom yeah yeah yeah, yeah exactly Those, yeah, yeah yeah okay um yeah so my my son being in first grade i see a lot of those those you know was used to be called the oriental trading company used to have those those catalogs that they sent out in the 90s that were all all really cheap plastic made in china um toys that they would give out as prizes when you did well in grade school um, I was wondered why the heck a teacher would want to give give students these toys that they're immediately going to throw across the room. Yeah, those toys, those those little half rubber balls that you turn inside out and then they pop back the other way. Um, that's a that's a good analogy there. And then we can wind up. So we wind up making this if we're not in the chair configuration we can get to this twist boat configuration where it's kind of that boat shape, but it's a little bit twisted so that you can avoid the torsion a little bit. Um, but we can actually go through that. If we flat, if we twisted it the other way, there's gonna be a, a point where there, where it's perfectly in that boat configuration, which is another transition state. So anytime you're going in between two, two stable points are gonna be concave up to use a calculus term meaning that they would hold water. If you poured water into that shape, it would hold water. Um, and But these transition states where it's a maximum in between two, two minimums are always gonna be, um, only exist for a split second, like our umbrella flipping inside out or our little rubber toy. Um, and so the boat is actually a transition state because that boat configuration had all of these eclipsed hydrogens and had these flagpole interactions. But we can kind of switch back and forth between the two twist configurations, um, the two twist boat configurations. And if we were in, if we did twist between the two, we could actually then take it and flip the other side of it down. So we can actually flip between which side is up and which side is down at any given point. If we're forcing the, the four carbons in the middle to basically stay in the middle, we can actually see the top end pop up and then the bottom end would switch and pop down. So we can actually switch which carbon is the headrest and the footrest, not just by rotating the molecule, but also by basically inverting the molecule. Um, and that's, we wind up seeing that that's a subtle difference because that's going to allow us to actually, um, when we get to these, these substituted um, cyclohexanes, it's going to be wind up being a difference if it's in the head position or the tail position as far as running into the other atoms in the molecule. Um, so from our textbook, here's a, a good example of how you can do it draw a chair configuration because we're going to keep doing this um so it's it's a good skill to have um it says draw a wide v draw a line going down at a 60 degree angle then draw a parallel line then draw your other one your other parallel lines basically it's going to be three sets of parallel lines is going to be the best way to draw these you just need to arrange them the right way 
Um, and I usually find it easiest to draw the two lines in the middle first, the two armrests, and then just connect the armrests with a V. So if I'm drawing it up here, you draw, start by drawing your two armrests just a little bit offset from each other. And then connect them with a V. And if you did it right, the two, all of your pairs of lines are going to wind up being parallel. Like this line is parallel to that line. This line is parallel to that line. And these two are parallel to each other. Um, and so it does take some practice. Um, and sometimes if you want it, so this has it drawn kind of pretty flat, like we're looking edge on because these lines are closer together. If I wanted to make them make it a little bit further apart, I could, if I drew them a little bit further apart, then it gets looking a little bit more like we're looking top down. And you have to use some some imagination when you're dealing with um, with chemists being artistic. Um, but when you get used to it's like the dots and the wedges when you get used to looking at it that way. You know you're trying to be turning this into a a 3D shape in your head when you can. If we're using the wedges to try and indicate what's closest to these really I probably should have just brought this one down further. That's a little bit better. Um, if we're trying to use the, the wedges to indicate how, how close something is to us, especially while you're getting used to this, it would be helpful to do that. Basically, draw them getting bigger as they're coming towards you. and then shade them in. And that starts looking a little bit more like a three-dimensional object, right? But even when you don't draw it, even when you have a sloppy one like this, that you didn't do any of the wedges, um, remember that this is a 3D object. This is the back of it. That's the side of the chair that's away from you. This is the armrest that's close to you, right? Because that's going to allow us to be able to visualize it in 3D and kind of rotate it in your head if need be. Um, or if you want to do it this process, that works too. They're starting somewhere else. And it's also kind of interesting. Um, let me see if I can find the, uh, if you look up the Budweiser logo, the there's one, that one, that logo there. Uh, not going to give me I'll do this. That logo, the one that looks like a bow tie, is a cyclohexane. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. Um, that is a cyclohexane, so you can always draw it like a weird bow tie, like a Budweiser logo, and visualize it that way too. So those are your two armrests. There's your headrest back here. There's your footrest. Um, just, just for fun. Now you can't unsee that. That's in your head now. Is that a coincidence, or is there just is there a reason to date? I think they drew it to look like a um, a bow tie, and it just happens that the graphic artist that they got to design the bow tie logo made it look like what. O chemists think of as a chair confirmation. Um, why it, why we care about being able to draw these things properly is going to come 
back to what's attached to each carbon. So when we had the, when the two things that were attached to each carbon were hydrogen, all we really cared about was keeping them all staggered, right? That kept everything far apart from each other, minimized all our strain, everything was happy. Um, and when we're drawing these, this cyclohexane, if we're actually including what's attached to each of these, these carbons, we actually wind up, if we remember, we're trying to keep these things um, tetrahedral shapes each of those carbons actually has two other things attached to it, and they're going to be in one of two positions, either what we call axial, meaning that it's going to go straight up and down, um, not straight up and down, but like if you think about the cyclohexane as being a hexagon, viewing it from above, the axial position is going to be going vertically. Um, and equatorial is basically pointed away from everything else. So the axial is pointed north if you want to think of if you think of the cyclohexane carbons as being the equator on a globe the equatorial position is pointing away from the equator the axial positions are pointed north or south um, and if we start adding them when um, to the other positions if we let me zoom in on the whiteboard here and I'll use the one that I actually shaded a little bit so we can see what's going on here. If we actually start looking at these really carefully. So remember this carbon that was the headrest has um, it's got a bond going away from us into the board towards the the rear armrest and it's got a bond coming out of the board towards us. And so if it's tetrahedral, the other two bonds are going to be flat in the plane of the board, right? Kind of facing 120 degrees from these other two, which is going to look like that. If we look at the other, if we look at um, this bottom carbon, we're going to have something that looks really similar, right? Because again, we've got a bond going into the board, a bond coming out of the board. So our last two are going to be in the plane of the board and as far away from each other as possible. So for these ones, for the, the headrest and the footrest, this is pretty straightforward to draw. And, and we can even see, okay, this one is pointed towards more towards everything else. And this is pointed more away from everything else. So this would be our equatorial, this would be our axial. Equatorial, axial. The other carbons, it's a little bit harder to visualize, but they also are going to have um, two other things attached in a tetrahedral shape. So this front carbon here, it's got one bond going away from us from here back towards the footrest. It's got one bond that's flat going from left to right. So that means we need another bond that's going to be coming towards us, pointed roughly the same direction as the bond going away from us. And then where does that leave the last bond? Up and flat, right? Actually, I should be drawing it the other way. And again, one of them is axial and one's equatorial. Which is which? Which one's pointed towards everything else? This one, right? Because it's going up and down relative to the ring. This one is going away from everything else, pointed away from the ring. Let's do this carbon. Once again, we've got a bond that's in the plane, that's flat, 
we've got a bond going away from us. So we need a bond coming out towards us that's going to be pointed roughly upward. And then our last bond is going to be straight down, basically. The ones that are going to be straight up and down are always going to be axial, whether they're pointed upward or downward. Those are always the axial positions. And the ones that are pointed away from everything else, even if the bond is flat, this is pointed away from everything else. And so is that these ones are pointed towards us. So they're away from everything else. So they're equatorial. These rear carbons are going to have something similar. This carbon's got a bond pointed towards us. So it's got a bond going away. And then the last bond would be going straight down, basically and flat. So that would be axial. One going away from us would be equatorial. Something similar here. We've got a bond coming towards us. So we're going to have another a bond going away from us. And then you're going to have one that's basically straight up and down. That's going to be sort of in the way of this. This other axial one is kind of in the way. So it gets convenient to draw these, the axial ones as being straight up and down so that they don't get in the way of everything else. But you guys kind of see how if you if you know that for each of these there's going to be something that's attached that's up and down and something, the other position is basically going to be pointed away from the other three bonds. We can kind of distinguish between the axial and the equatorial a little bit. And it takes practice and especially at first, it's helpful to go through that process. Okay, this carbon has a bond going away from us and a bond coming towards us. Therefore, the other two bonds have to be flat. Remember, we're always trying, when it's tetrahedral carbon, we're looking for a bond, two bonds that are flat in the plane of the board, and then a bond going away from us and a bond coming towards us. Those are the four different directions we're looking for for these tetrahedral shapes. Oh, come here. And why this matters, let me get zoomed out again. Um, why this matters, no, you can't be up there, get down. All right, go eat your peach outside. It does not take them long to figure out how to guilt trip you. I waved her away and she goes, no huggy. Okay, well now, now I have to say yes. And she knows that. Um, so why this winds up mattering is because these axial positions wind up being in the way with, they wind up interacting with each other. Where if you, if you can think about all these different axial positions, the axial position on this carbon here is going to be pointed the same way as the axial, axial position from the headrest, right? And so if we have a big object, a big substituent attached here in this X position, it's going to interact with these other substituents that are, even if they're just hydrogens, that are also in the axial position. position. But if we go through that we call it a chair flip. Um, sounds like a WWF, WWE move. Um, if you go through a chair flip, 
you wind up actually switching whether your substituent is axial or equatorial. Which means if you have something big in an axial position, if you flip everything around, if you flip this end downward and this end upward, now all of a sudden what was the axial position is going to be pointed away from everything else and not going to be interacting with everything else. So we can actually predict which conformer is going to be more stable by what keeps the biggest substituents in the equatorial position. So let's try that. So if we're starting from bromocyclohexane, let's start by trying to draw a chair conformation and then we'll draw the chair flip and that'll show us the other conformation of bromocyclohexane. And so start by just by drawing your chair. If you're following the rules on there, if you start with the wide V, and then you're basically just going to add some parallel lines till you get something similar. It looks like it's a little bit tweaked to the side compared to where I drew it here, but it's same thing really, right? Looks more like the Budweiser logo here, but. Um, Either way, like I said before, it's usually easiest to, if we have, if we have a substituent here to put the substituent on one of the two points because the two positions on so the the points the headrest and the footrest had a bond going away from us and a bond coming towards us, right? So that means our equatorial axial and our equatorial positions are both going to be in the plane of the board if we put our substituent here. So it's a little bit easier when we're getting used to these ideas. Okay, so we have two, two options. Actually, let's switch the color. Because if we have going away from us, coming towards us, the last two things we, we want are two that are in the plane of the board, away from each other. Right, so if we're just talking about bromocyclohexane, it doesn't really matter which of those two positions, if we're going to draw both of them to be um, confirmations, it doesn't really matter which spot we put our, our bromine on. So just pick one. If you start with it on the axial position, so remember this is axial because it's pointed up and down relative to the ring. But you can kind of see a little bit if I if you think about the other axial bonds that, that are here, even if they're just hydrogens, they're all sort of pointed the same direction as the bromine, right? And so if you know bromines are really big molecule or a big atom, you, you're gonna have more steric forces pushing. But on the, from these hydrogens from the bromine, just because it takes up a lot of space. If we can get this bromine to be in the equatorial position, though, it would be pointed away from everything else. And so the way we we would start from this configuration. and get to the other configuration, we wouldn't just, and I'll explain why in a minute, but basically we don't want to just, okay, erase the bromine, put it there. 
because sometimes we need to flip these confirmations without just erasing the bond because maybe there's something else attached on this side of the molecule that we need to keep where it is. Um, so we can't just erase it and put it on the other side. So instead, if we do a chair flip, all we're basically going to do is we're going to put the headrest down and put the footrest up. So we could start by making it look like a, a boat confirmer. If we took the headrest and we put it and we flipped it all the way down so it was pointed the same way, the bromine's still going to be pointed the same direction. It's still attached to that same carbon, right? So if you think of, of the flipping this all the way down, the bromine is still sticking the same direction. So the bromine goes from being straight up and down to when we switch to the boat, we're going to get, these are actually a little bit harder to draw once you get the hang of it. Something about like that for our carbons and the bromine, our two, our two positions, rotated with that carbon. So our bromine is now pointed away from everything else. That's a chair, not a, or that's a boat, not a chair though. And the boats are not stable. It's an upside down boat, but it's a boat. So if we do the exact same thing on the other side, we take this end and flip it up. We're, we're going to rearrange that. So it's now pointed the other way. And if you look at what happened to the two things attached to the bromine carbon, the bromine was axial, but by going through this chair flip, we put it into the equatorial spot where now it's not pointed towards anything else. And so it won't interact with anything else as much. And if we looked at it, this one, if you drew it this way, again, it's going to wind up looking. We're going to take this and flip it down. So we wind up with, so how does it say wide V and then start drawing parallel lines except we want that to be the upward, something a little more like that. And we're keeping these blue for the sake of consistency. So by Drawn by going through that chair flip, by flipping the top end down and the bottom end up, whatever was in an axial position turns into equatorial. And what it, whatever was equatorial becomes axial because we basically flipped our umbrella inside out. So what was up is now down and so on. We inverted the molecule basically without breaking any bonds. And we are just about out of time. But in the last two minutes, even if it's something as small as a methyl that's attached to cyclohexane, um, if everything's the same size, everything that's attached to your cyclohexane group is the same size, then we wind up with basically um, there is no difference between all the different conformers, right? It can go be going through these chair chair flips back and forth, but nothing's really changing if everything's the same size. So as soon as you have one thing that's bigger, we're actually going to wind up with a different equilibrium between the two states. So even if it's something as small as a methyl group, a methyl group will wind up have will be 95% of the time. If you took a snapshot and you looked at all the molecules of methyl cyclohexane, 95% of them are going to have that methyl group in an equatorial position. 
and 5% of them will have the methyl group in an axial position. And the bigger that group is, the more pronounced that difference is. If it was a bromine, it's like 99.9% .9 of the time the bromine is in the equatorial and 0.1% of the time it's in the axial. And when you start adding things other than hydrogen on here, if you have a dimethyl cyclohexane, we wind up with those interactions being compounded. And so being able to take the skeletal structure and draw the stable conformer, the most stable conformer based on these structures is what we're going for here, right? Because this doesn't actually tell you the 3D structure. I mean, it does indirectly, but you have to then draw your two chair conformations and then pick which one is the one that puts the, the biggest group in the equatorial position to know which one's going to be more stable. Right? So it's a little bit more complicated than doing the Newman projections, where once we got the, our Newman projection drawn, everybody pretty quickly was able to see, OK, you put the biggest things apart from each other. That's easy. These ones, because we can't just twist however we want, because we've got this ring structure, takes a little bit more thought. And that's what we'll keep working on on Thursday. Right. Any questions for right now? I have a quick yes or no question about the lab. Yeah. Do you want us answering those last four like uh, conclusion questions or? From last week's lab? Yeah. Yes. OK, cool. Um, and then this week's lab, this week is actually was scheduled to be um, just you guys working on finding research project articles. So good week to to browse sites looking for research articles about organic chemistry that at least tie some amount of organic chemistry in preferably things that we have talked about so far which i know we're kind of limited on our topics at this point um, but even if it's just stuff like solubility or functional groups um, and so you might not want to be fully in the world of the journal of organic chemistry at this point um, things that are more general that have to do with organic chemistry, or even just some talking about, um, you know, science in general that brings in some of the ideas of equilibrium or um, stability. If you wanted to analyze that article on phosphine gas on Venus, if you wanted to go through that and analyze, um, you know, using some of the language that we're going to talk about in organic chemistry and that we have talked about, um, that would be fine. Um, so, but for now, and I'll and I'll help you pick which articles are going to be you know most applicable to what we're doing or most within our reach at this point um so for now i just want you guys to find four abstracts and i'll introduce this in more detail we'll talk about the research project in lab but just so you're thinking about it between now and then your lab assignment is just going to be find four peer-reviewed chemistry articles that you can present to the class All right so we'll go ahead and end the recording